Good morning. Welcome uh, as we join together for our time of worship here in Alexandra this morning. It's really good to be together again for those who um, are watching or, or listening after. It's really good to know that you are uh, with us as well. Just a couple of announcements uh, as we begin our time together and there are a few to, to make our way uh, through today. Um, connect groups are going to meet this week, so whether you're part of the Tuesday, uh, Wednesday or Friday groups, this will be the, the last opportunity for us to get together uh, and have a look at our uh, series in Ruth. So that's this week. Um, and uh, your leaders will be in touch just with the, the Zoom details for the, the online uh, meeting for that. A reminder for committee that we're going to have a very brief meeting today after the service, so please do stay around for that. And um, just a couple of things by way of update, and uh, that will make sure we're, we have everything up to date before uh, the summertime and before our next meeting in September. So, members of the committee, please do uh, remain afterwards. Um, the latest copy of the Wider Word magazine, so at the back, so if you haven't got that, your, your name will be on one if you subscribe to that. I think there might still be one or two spares, but um, have a look at the table uh, on the back uh, for that. Um, Crash is resuming today with helpers, so please feel free to use that. It will be in the lounge um, as usual, that will be up and running from today uh, onwards. The Free Food Friday will the table will continue this week, and it will be on the gazebo there on Castleton Avenue. And it's been really great to see virtually nothing left. Um, I come down here on a Friday afternoon, so word continues to spread about that, and that's that's really good. Please uh, keep on uh, keep on doing that. Um, our new members classes are going to be uh, getting underway very shortly, so please speak to me today if at all possible. If you're interested in that, or if you have any uh, questions about that, you don't need to give me any more commitment than that, but please do speak to me today so that we can get those arranged um, with the hope that any new members will uh, join at our uh, Lord's Supper later uh, this month. So there'll be three different get-togethers across June and um, we'll, we'll arrange that uh, with whoever is there and whatever suits, but uh, please do speak to me today if you're interested or have any questions um, about that. And thinking a little bit further ahead, uh, the, the next Women's Walk and Talk is going to be on Thursday the 24th of June at a quarter past seven and that's going to be around the Grove so please do keep that date free and if you want to know any more about that uh, speak to Grace but that's Thursday the 24th of June um, at a quarter past seven and then finally thinking a little bit further ahead again and into the summer uh, we're planning for our holiday bible club and our plan A is to have it in person maybe with a smaller number of children and plan B if that's not possible will be online, but we're going to get together for a planning meeting this Thursday on Zoom. Some of the members of the Christian Union at uh, Jordanstown are, are uh, very interested in helping out with that, so we're going to get together with them and anyone from the church who, who is interested, that's going to be on Thursday night, so please speak to me and I'll get you the Zoom details um, just as we start to think about what might be possible and plan towards that. So we're planning to have it in person, so uh, if you're, you're interested in helping with that, um, you, you will be more than welcome and will be more than glad to have you involved. So that's this Thursday night at home Zoom. Our call to worship today is a, an invitation and it's also a reminder. It comes from Romans chapter 5. Let me read that for us as we uh, begin our time of worship together. You see, just at the right time, when we were still part of Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're going to think about that as we sing our opening hymn together. My hope is built on nothing less. We're going to stay seated as we sing and as we join in. And our praise of God.
Let's join together. Father God, we thank you that as we worship here today, we come as people who are marked out by hope. We come as people of hope. Lord, not hopeful people, not people who wish and wonder if something might happen, but Lord, people of hope because of who we have come to worship. Lord, just as we have been singing together, our, our hope really is built on nothing less than Jesus. Lord, our hope is built on nothing less than our Saviour and our Lord, the one who has died in our place for us, the one who has swapped our sinfulness for his righteousness, for his goodness, his perfection, his holiness, all that he is, he has swapped for our sin. And Lord, as we think about that, as we consider that, as we remind ourselves of that in approaching you, Lord, we thank you that we can and we do come as people of hope, because this is true. Lord, we come as people who have that sure and solid foundation of your word to stand on. Lord, we know the promises of your word, promises that have never been found to be wanting or untrue or questionable. Lord, in your word we read of everything that we need to know. We read of our beginnings, of how you've made us, of how you've made the world. We find so many questions answered even in the, the opening part of your word. And yet, Lord, we, we look around and we see a word that, was, that is not as it was created to be, not as you intended it to be. But Lord, a word, that, a word that is full of sin and decay, full of those things that you offer to take from us because of Jesus. And yet, Lord, we thank you that we can still see you in our world. We can still see those things that you've told us and know that they are pointing us to a creator just as you promised it would. And Lord, we thank you for the promises of a saviour, Lord, in your word. As we open up, as we stand on the foundations of all that your word gives us, we thank you that we see the one who was promised, the one who is our king, the one who is our saviour, the one who has come to do what we are unable to do for ourselves. And so we thank you that even recently in our time in the book of 1 Samuel, it is pointing us to these things, pointing us to a king, to a rescuer, to a servant who would suffer and yet not utter a word. Points us to Jesus, points us to the one who came and took on flesh and kept that promise that you have made right throughout your word. Father, as we worship you today, Lord, we pray that we might see these things, Lord, we might know these things for ourselves. Lord, shine a light in our lives, Lord, help us to look inward and see, Lord, those ways that, Lord, we are not living faithfully before the King, that we are not looking to this rescuer that you've provided, that, Lord, we are not trusting fully in the, the one who will be the, the suffering servant. Lord, help us to look to him, Lord, help us to trust him, help us to build our lives upon him. Help us to know that, Lord, this and this alone is the surest foundation that we will ever find. And so, Lord, as we worship together, as we pray together, as we hear your word read and preached, Lord, we pray that it would prepare us and help us to build our whole lives on Jesus, on the solid rock, on the one who will and can and never be moved. Lord, help us to look to him, help us to see him in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today again we're going to take three chapters in the book of 1 Samuel. Different parts of the book, kind of these chunks, um, are helpful if we take them together. And hopefully, um, as we continue through our service, we'll, we'll see why that is today. Some things that really fit together. And chapters 24 and 26 really are a mirror image of each other. So we're going to begin by reading 1 Samuel chapter 24. If you have your Bible with you, please turn to that, um, or the word can also be on the screen. <clears throat> After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. 
David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's room. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his room. He said to his men, The Lord forbid it that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. After Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out to the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord the King. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord, because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me, hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrong you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul said, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept a lot. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me, and the Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go and get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you have treated me today. You know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. I swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul, and then Saul returned home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. Amen. And we, we give thanks to God for, for his word to us. Well, let me, let me ask uh, the children in particular, but everyone, to, uh, a question as we begin today. If you were going to have a party, what are some of the things that you would need? What would be on your checklist if you were going to have a party? Hands up if you can think what it is. So Ethan's hands straight up. A cake, excellent. What type of cake? Vanilla, okay, well, we would sell for that. Preferably chocolate, but that's, that's okay. We'll have a sponge, that's not so bad. Okay, yep, really good for the first answer. A cake, if you want to have a party big enough to cut it into and be able to share around. Yep, absolutely. What else might we need if we were having a party or planning for a party? Ice cream. Ice cream. I'll, I'll like the thinking here in Alexander. I'll like the thinking. Excellent, yes. Some ice cream for afterwards. Maybe a little bit of jelly. Okay, a little bit of jelly and ice cream. Excellent. What, what else? What, some balloons, yes, absolutely. Going to need to decorate the place as a party. People have to know it's a party whenever they arrive, don't they? Whether it's your house or somewhere else. Excellent. What else? These are all great suggestions. What else might we need? Music, music yes, absolutely. Some good music. Perfect. Maybe for past the parcel. Yeah, absolutely. No, David's no, not possible. Okay, but we would need some music, yeah. Some music, some cake, some ice cream, some balloons. Give me one more thing that we might think we need if we're going to plan a party. People. People, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Or they could just leave the presents at the door, I suppose. <laughs> but yeah, people, yeah, that's right. It wouldn't be a lot of fun if we were there, I'm sure it wouldn't. Excellent, perfect answer. We would need people, we'd need balloons, we'd need cake, we would need ice cream, and we'd need people to be able to share with. 
But there's one other really important thing, and I did hear it earlier on, but I had to strategically ignore it. But there is one other thing that we really need if we are going to have a party, we're going to really enjoy ourselves. We would need an invite, we would need an invitation. We would need to tell people where to come, we need people to tell when to come, and help them to be able to get there. And let them know more than anything else, you are invited, I want you to come to my party. So whether it's a birthday party, or whatever else, we need to give people an invitation. And invitations are really, really important if we're going to have a party. Jesus once told his disciples and people who were around him a story all about the importance of this, all about the importance of planning to have a party, a great feast as he described it. And he talked about the importance of having invitations and giving them out. So Jesus told this parable, this story to his disciples, and in Jesus' day, people would have got two invitations. They would have got one to be able to tell people all about the party or the get-together that someone was having, and then they would get a second one to tell them, it's ready, you can come now, come to my party, come and enjoy yourself. In Jesus' parable, he said that people were told about this feast, about this party and they knew all about it and they knew when it was going to be but then the second invitation went out and people were told now is the time you can come he said one guest after another began to make what they began to make excuses about not being able to come to the party they began to come with all sorts of reasons and excuses why they weren't able to come to this feast Somebody said, well, I have just bought some land and actually I need to go and make sure it's okay. Someone else said, well, I have just bought some ox and I need to go and test them out to make sure they're all right. And someone else said, well, I just got married so I can't come at this particular time. And the host, Jesus says in his story, in his parable, the host became really annoyed. He became very disappointed and he became very angry. And so his servants that he had sent out to tell these people that the feast was ready and the party was ready to come to, he said, you know what? Go to someone else. Go to other people. Go to people who live on the margins. Go to people who are sick. Go to people who are blind. Go to people who are poor. Because this feast will not be empty. I want the tables to be filled. Go and tell everyone like that that you can find. Why do you think Jesus told a story like this? Why do you think he told us something important about invitations to a great party and to a great feast? Well, he wanted us, he wanted the disciples, those who were around to hear it and us, to be able to understand the importance of the invitation. The importance of the invitation that Jesus himself gives to all of us. The importance of the invitation to the great feast, the great party, to the greatest get-together there will ever be, and that is spending eternity with him, spending forever with Jesus. And a couple of weeks ago, we thought about the message that we have been given, and we thought about the gospel and what that means, the good news of Jesus, about who he is, why he came, what it means to follow him, and we thought about what the gospel does, the way it bears fruit, it grows, it goes all around the world, and you know, whenever we share this message, whenever we take out the story of the gospel, this is what we are doing. We are giving out this invitation. This invitation that Jesus describes in this parable. An invitation to the greatest get together that they will ever be, which is forever with God. And that's what God asks us to do. He asks us to take out the invitation. And you know, we give it to people, don't we? And sometimes people will respond just like that first group of people that Jesus describes in this parable. Maybe people will make excuses. Maybe people will not want to hear it or accept this invitation at all. But then there will be other people. There will be other people who hear it and are so glad to get this invitation. And that's what Jesus says to us as well. He says, take it to everyone. These tables will be filled. Take this invitation to everyone that you can find. Those who are in the lanes, those who are in the hedges, those who are on the outside of things, take this invitation to everyone that you can. And so that's our job, isn't it? As we thought about a couple of weeks ago, we have the gospel. We have the great news of who Jesus is. And what are we to do with it? 
We are to take it out like an invitation. We are to share it with everyone that we can. And what will happen? God will do the rest. We can trust God to do everything else that is needed. But we take out the invitation. Well, you're going to be able to make your way now to uh, KFC and to Crash for those who are going out and you have a, an opportunity to do that together. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood at the top of the hill some distance away, and there was a wide space between them. He called out to the army and to Abner, the son of Ner, Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you that calls to the king? David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard the Lord your king? Someone came to destroy your Lord the King today. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men must die, because you did not guard your master and the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, my Lord the King. And he added, Why is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? And what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my Lord the King listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has decided you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, people have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have driven me today from my share in the Lord's inheritance, and have said, Go serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The King of Israel has come out to look for a flea as the one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you have considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have been terribly wrong. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I did not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Surely as I value your life today, so may the Lord value my life and may deliver me from all my trouble. And Saul said to David, May you be blessed, David, my son. He will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. We'll leave our uh, reading there. 
Well, let's join together uh, for our prayers and intercession just before we could come to, to consider these chapters for the first time. Let, let's pray together. Father God, as we look ahead to the summer months, we bring before you our plans that we begin to make and we begin to look towards for uh, our holiday Bible club and other aspects of the life of, of the church here. Lord, we thank you for those who uh, are willing and keen to be involved uh, from the Christian Union in Jordanstown. Father, we thank you for them uh, and we thank you, Lord, for all of the plans uh, that you would have for them, not only in this time, but, but in the time to ahead. Lord, we pray that you would help us as we would get together. You, you would help us as we would try to put plans in place. Lord, we know that the situation we find ourselves in means that we, we try to juggle different possibilities all at the same time. But Father, our prayer is that you would help us, help us to know your will. Or help us to be faithful to what you would have us to do, what you would have us plan, uh, and what, Lord, might be possible. And Lord, our, our plan is that you would help us to, to be able to get the most out of what we are able to do. Lord, we know that restrictions come and go. We know that sometimes they change, even on a, a week-to-week or month-to-month basis. But Lord, we thank you that your plans are higher than ours. Your ways are greater than ours. Lord, your thoughts are much more than ours. And so, Father, our prayer is that you would help us to be guided by you. Help us to know, Lord, what your will is. And help us to follow what we pray. Lord, we also want to pray for our plans and uh, for the, the preparations that we have made to, with the, the possibility of having a community mission worker come and be part of, of the congregation here. We pray for the final stages of our application for funding, both to uh, CMI within the Presbyterian Church centrally and to the Urban Mission Trust within our presbytery here. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement that we've seen at, at each step of the way. And we thank you, Lord, for your hand that has clearly guided us throughout the past weeks and months in this process. And Lord, as we would uh, wait for the outcome and confirmation, Lord, we pray again that, that we might know your will and be able to follow. We pray, Lord, if this is your will, that, Lord, even that person who is your choosing would, Lord, would be being prepared at this uh, very moment in time. But, Lord, thank you for all that you've done, and thank you for all that we can see in this process. Uh, and we pray that we might, uh, Lord, have peace to follow uh, your will. And, Lord, we know that at this moment in time, we're not able to make our gifts and offerings during the service as we normally do. But, Father, as we do this either before or afterwards, Lord, we know that <clears throat> this continues to be part of our worship, part of, Lord, how we give ourselves to you. And so, Lord, we pray that as we would do that, Lord, today and in the weeks ahead, Lord, help us to know that, Father, you not only want what is in our pockets, but, Lord, you want the work of our hands, <coughs> or maybe the work of our hearts and, and our whole lives. Lord, help us in this week that is ahead of us to consider how that might be for us, Lord, what that might look like, Lord, as we would serve you with our hands and our hearts and our lives. Lord, help us to think about that parable that Jesus told of taking out the invitation to those who are on the margins, to those who we might not necessarily think of first. Lord, may we play our part in that. Lord, may we see how you would have us to do that. And so, Father, all this we bring, all this we uh, bring before you in our prayers and intercession. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> well, in our series, the book of 1 Samuel, we, we have seen different themes appearing, haven't we? We're, we're very nearly at the end, just um, six chapters are left before us. But we've seen different themes emerge, and one of them has, has been about making choices and making decisions, and, and I suppose how we do that. A big thing throughout the book has been um, how the king of God's people has been chosen. We saw how David was chosen as Israel's next king. And we see the contrast in how the people wanted to choose a king for themselves. The book, as we've said more than once, centers around this call for a king for God's people. And the people make it clear, don't they, what they want, what their choice looks like. We want a king over us. A king that will make us like all of the other nations. A king who will lead us, is what they say, and go out and fight our battles. We want to be like the rest, is essentially 
what Israel said in her call for a king. But then in chapter 16, we see how David is chosen as their next king. And it's a word away from the people's choice, isn't it? What are those words that we have remembered to this day from, from chapter 16? But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so the Lord sees differently. The Lord looks for different things and the Lord chooses differently. And so that is why David ends up being chosen as their next king. The youngest, the smallest and the most insignificant of the sons of Jesse. And we've seen that theme again throughout the book. Now in these three chapters, chapters 24, 25 and 26, it's time for David to make some choices for himself. Some very significant choices he has to make in these three chapters. And the chapters really are, are a sandwich. On one hand we have chapters 24 and 26 and they are a mirror image of each other when Saul is, is brought before David. Um, not by David's choice, not by how David um, brought about, but, David, but Saul is brought before him and he has this opportunity. But it's an opportunity he doesn't take up, not on one occasion, but on two. And in chapter 25, lots of different episode all together, but it provides a, a similar lesson for us in a really important choice that David has to make. Let's look at these choices which present themselves to David and how he deals with them at each time. Let's start with that chapter in the middle, the one that we didn't read from, but chapter 25. Chapter 25 is this in-between chapter of the three that we've read. And we're told of a time when David and some of his men are protecting some sheep. Some sheep that belong to a man called Nabal. And trouble comes whenever it's sheep shearing time. Because David goes to get what he feels his men are owed. They have looked after this flock. They have done an important job for Nabal. And they go and they look for their reward or what they feel that they are owed. Nabal, as we're told in chapter 25, means foolish, and he acts pretty foolishly here. He acts pretty foolishly towards David and his men. If you read the chapter, you'll find that he essentially says, who does David think he is? Who is this slave? Who is this person wandering from place to place and thinks that I should give him anything, is essentially what Nabal says. And it's fair to say that David doesn't take too kindly to this. He readies his men, each with a sword, and he's ready to go and take what he feels he is owed. In fact, he's also ready to go and take Nabal's life and most of his possessions. Such is his anger at being wronged in this way. And he's on his way to do this until Nabal's wife intervenes. Abigail meets David halfway and she pleads with him. And it's not really in a way that's just trying to save her husband. It's more in a way of trying to save David from himself. To save David from making this really bad decision of making the wrong choice. And it's in a way that she reminds David of what God has promised him. In fact, it seems a lot like God has sent her to remind David of these things, of what David has already been told about. What does she say? What are some of the things that she reminds him of? Well, verse 28 in chapter 25 is one of them. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord, for David, because you fight the Lord's battles, and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. She's saying to David, you can trust God to protect you. Live his way. Honour him with the decisions that you make, is what she's saying. Chapter, uh, verse 26 as well. Since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. God had sent her to keep David from bloodshed. God had clearly sent this woman from stopping David, avenging for himself, taking matters into his own hands. And she was reminding him that you can trust God. You can trust God to bring about justice. 
And what she says is true, what she says comes true. Because before the chapter is out, the death of Nabal is recorded. David didn't need to intervene, he didn't need to do anything. And Abigail helped him to make the right choice. He had a choice to make, and he saw sense in the end. And how did he see sense in the end? Because someone came along and reminded him of God's word. Someone came along and pointed him to the Lord. And reminded him what was right and what was wrong. You know, from time to time, we're all in need of that, aren't we? We're all in need of someone who will point us to the Lord. Someone who will point us to his word and help us make the right choice. Maybe in times whenever we don't know where to turn, we need something like that, don't we? In times whenever we need someone to help us cut through all of the uncertainty and say, remember, remember what God has said in his word, we can trust him. Times maybe when even we need to be corrected and we can be reminded of the truth that we find in God's word. Times whenever we need to go a different way, maybe away from what others around us are encouraging us to do or say or act or whatever it may be. But times when we're reminded that we can go a different way. You know, a friend like that is worth, a, is worth their weight in gold, isn't it? Someone who can point us to God and say, remember his promises. Remember, we can trust him. And I suppose that makes us ask ourselves the question, well, who are we surrounding ourselves with? Do we have people like that in our life? Do we turn to people like that when we need to? Do we have people who will help us to see these things? People who will help us to remember what God has said in his word? That's one of the really important decisions that David needs, needs to make in this part of 1 Samuel. And he makes the right one because God provides someone at just the right time to point out what he has said. And then we think about chapters 24 and, and 26 and as I said, they really are a mirror image of each other and they both provide David with the same, uh, the same decision, the same choice twice. And of course, at this point in the story, we remember that David is very much on the run from Saul. Not that long ago, David is chosen as the next king of Israel. He is the one who defeats Goliath. He is the one uh, that was promised one day that he would be king. But it's in the aftermath of this victory that Saul becomes green with envy, isn't it? He's envious of how people see David. They're thankful to him. They look up to him. They treat David the way that Saul thinks he should be treated as king. And so, so Saul repeatedly attempts to take David's life. So it leaves David on the run. He's going from place to place to place. He's essentially a fugitive. He is sleeping in caves, as we saw the last time out. And who does he gather around him? Well, he gathers 600 men, we're told. But where do they come from? They come from those who are distressed, those who are in debt, those who are discontent. And so we picked up our reading this morning at the, the start of chapter 24 and we, we find David in this exact context. He's hiding in the caves of Engedi. Saul continues his pursuit. And not only that, he pursues with 3,000 able young men, as verse 2 tells us. It's a substantial number. And when you think about it, David and his men are outnumbered 6 to 1. But, but it's at this point that Saul... Well, he needs a toilet break, doesn't he? He needs to relieve himself, as we read in chapter 24. And which cave does he happen to choose? He happens to choose the one where David and his men are hiding in the back of. When David's men see this, when they see Saul coming in alone, they can't believe it. They can't believe their eyes, or maybe even their luck. They say to David, or maybe most likely whisper in his ear, this is this is your opportunity. This is what God said would happen. David, this is your moment. What did David do though? What does the end of verse 4 tell us? David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. You imagine the reaction of David's men. Can you imagine them looking from side to side at each other? What is he doing? What has he just done? Saul's army, no doubt, outside, 3,000 of them compared to their own 600. Saul raises their alarm, this is the end. There's 
You know to run when you're in the back of a cave. What has he just done? But we remember a time, don't we, when David struck Goliath and he cut off his head. And yet here he chooses to cut off the corner just of Saul's rule. And the verses which follow, maybe they help us to get a grasp on why this is. Immediately we're told that David was conscience stricken. and He warned his men not to touch Saul. Listen to how he describes Saul in verse 6. He said to his men, the Lord forbid it that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, or lay my hand on the Lord's anointed. Saul is the Lord's anointed, David says. Yes, David has been chosen as king. Yes, he is the one who has been promised to succeed him on the throne. But that should happen in the Lord's way. That should happen when the Lord chooses it. That should happen according to what he brings about. See, his men were enthusiastic and they were trying to help when they said, this is just what the Lord had promised. But the problem was, this wasn't what the Lord had said at all. This isn't how the Lord had promised this should happen. And even though David could have taken Saul's life right there and then, he didn't. But still, his conscience, his conscience rather, is pierced at just cutting off a corner of his room. Why is that? Well, it's because it was a deeply symbolic thing to do. Remember back in chapter 15, when Saul is rejected as king, <clears throat> he pleads with Samuel, he grabs Samuel's robe until it tears. Samuel turns around and says, that, that is what's going to happen to your kingdom when it's torn from you. And then in then chapter 18, David is given Jonathan's robe. It's a symbol that one day the kingdom will be his. Something that should have been Jonathan as, as his inheritance. He should have been next in line to the throne. But he gives his robe to David. And he says, no, it will be yours. You are the Lord's choice. And so coming in Saul's robe is symbolic. Because David comes to realise that the bottom line is the kingdom is not his to take for himself. The, the kingdom is not his to take by force. The Lord had promised it and the Lord would deliver it. Being the Lord's anointed meant that the Lord had given it to Saul and it wasn't up to David to take it away. Not in that way. And so no matter how good the opportunity seemed at the time, no matter what others said in his ear, no matter what they whispered to him, it was not to be done in this way. David faced a choice that day between what he could have done and what he knew was the right thing to do. And his path to the throne, it could have been so much quicker. It could have been so much smoother had he taken that opportunity. Or had he taken the opportunity again in chapter 26 as it presents itself to him. This time the Ziphites betray David, they tell Saul where David is. Once again, Saul races down with 3,000 of his best men. This time David is expecting Saul, he knows and he waits for his arrival. And so he takes one of his trusted men, Abishai, and he goes to the camp where Saul has set up at night. And they arrive when Saul is asleep. What do they see beside Saul? They see his spear stuck in the ground. Once more there is a voice, this time from Abishai, which encourages David. He says, now, now is the time. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. At this time David explains a bit more of his reasoning. This time in verse 10 of chapter 26, he, he explains why this is not the right thing to do. The Lord himself will strike him, David said, or his time will come to an end and he will die. Or he will go to battle and he will perish. But the Lord forbid it that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Instead he takes Saul's spear and his water jug as he leaves. And we read that afterwards of how he's able to prove that he was there. And he didn't lay a hand on Saul. Another opportunity. Another encouragement for him to take Saul's life. Another whisper in his ear. And he says no, this is not the right choice. To make. Why? Because he knew this was not the Lord's will. What's the lesson for us in these two chapters, in these two episodes that are remarkably similar to each other? Well, David helps us to see how we can live out something 
that we probably pray regularly, if not all the time. Something that we pray as part of how Jesus himself taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. And that's how we pray all of the time, isn't it? But what are we saying whenever we pray that? What is Jesus asking us to pray? Well, he's asking us to pray that God's will would happen, that his will would be done, enacted here in our world, just as much as it is in the heavenly places. And you know, at first that seems like a pretty straightforward thing for us to pray, doesn't it? A fairly easy thing for us to ask or agree with. As followers of Jesus, of course we want God's will to be done. How could we not? Why would we not? But stop to think for a minute what that really means and what that really looks like. Because sometimes what it looks like is what we find here in these two chapters of First Samuel. Sometimes there are occasions whenever we might realise that actually the Lord's will is really difficult. Times we might realise that the Lord's will might go against an opportunity that is right there before us. Sometimes it might be that the Lord's will means saying no to the easier, shorter or more straightforward road that is ahead of us. That's what it meant for David, didn't it? It meant all of these things twice for David. His journey to the crown, it could have ended there and then. He took those opportunities to end Saul's life. His life on the run, his life going from cave to cave could have ended right there. But what did he choose? He chose the Lord's will over his own convenience, over making his own life easier, over taking things into his own hands. And so David's long, slow and at times painful road to the throne continued after this, choosing what God had planned over his own will. I wonder if that sounds familiar. I wonder does it remind you of the one who was tested, the one who was tested in the wilderness. Jesus faced a similar choice, didn't he, when he was tested by Satan in the wilderness. When Satan told him in Luke 4 that, that he would give Jesus all authority and all the splendor that he could ever wish for, if only he would bow down, if only he would acknowledge who Satan was, if only he would worship Satan himself. And as one commentator puts it, the temptation that was wrapped up in that choice for Jesus was to press the fast forward button in life. Because as Jesus ascended to heaven, he would have all the splendor and all the authority that he could ever ask for. But what was the real temptation behind what Satan was saying? The real temptation was to press the fast forward button, was to say, you shouldn't have to suffer in order to get there. You can have all of this right now and you don't need to go through that suffering. This, <clears throat> this can be yours right now. And you will remember through our journey uh, in Mark's Gospel and those who did Christianity Explored recently, what did Jesus continue to make clear to his disciples? He continued to make clear that he had to suffer. He had come to suffer. Why? Because this was God's plan. This was how we were going to be rescued from our sin. You know, see, Jesus suffered and he died for us. He died in our place. But that doesn't mean that all suffering for us is finished, does it? Doesn't mean that we never suffer in this life. Doesn't mean that we never face hardships or trouble or difficulties in this life. <clears throat> you know, there are times whenever choosing God's will to be done. There are times whenever praying that and meaning that means that we have to say no to what might seem like the easier way, the more straightforward way, the way that would allow us to press the fast forward button Sometimes it might even mean hardship for us. Sometimes it might even mean turning our back on the things that we would really love to choose at that moment in time. And sometimes it can be difficult to know God's will, can but sometimes it's not all that straightforward. But how can we know it? How can we find it out? Well, Jesus gave us an example, didn't he? 
after the temptation he faced in the wilderness, after his ministry, after making it clear that he had to suffer and die, where does he end up? He ends up in the garden at Gethsemane. And it's in his anguish, his anguish of all that's before him. It's in the middle of sweating drops of blood because he realizes what is potentially before him. What does he do in that garden? He gets down, he kneels, and he prays. He prays about the Father's will. He prays so that he can know what his Father's will really is. And how does he end that prayer? He says, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus prays and he submits to his Father's will, even Jesus. And for us, well, if we're going to pray those words that he has taught us, we're going to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we're going to mean it, there are times whenever we will have to do the same, aren't there? Times when we will have to seek God's will. Times when we'll have to take time to find out what that is. And times when we need to trust him in that. Times when we might need to say no to the easier, the smoother, or the more convenient route. Just like it did for David, and just like it did for Jesus. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray before we come to our final prayers. Lord God, we thank you that as we open up your word once again here in the book of 1 Samuel, that Lord, you speak to us. Lord, you speak into our very lives, into our situations. You remind us, Lord, of what it means to be a follower of your Son. You remind us of what it means to know Jesus as our Saviour and also as our Lord. Father, help us as we would seek your will. Help us as we, Lord, would spend time wanting to know what that really is in our lives. Lord, as you would make that clear, as you would give us a sense of peace about that, Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to know that, Lord, we can follow your lead uh, and, Lord, we can go in the way that you would choose for us. Lord, help us to do that, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. Well, we're going to stay seated as we uh, sing our concluding praise and the words are all on the screen again. What grace is mine. <laughs>
Let's pray. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, both now and forevermore. Amen. Just a reminder if a member of the committee would uh, stay behind afterwards and we'll, we'll meet briefly and, and uh, others can make their way as we normally do. First in the gallery, followed by this half, and then finally this half, all the ground floor.